Thank you. 
Trying to settle Leila a little bit, I just told her that you know this is probably the most important presentation of her career. Uh, it didn't quite work as intended, but but it is, and, and I know that she's really happy that you're here, and so am I, uh, especially people that came in uh, from, from far away. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, Leila's academic credentials and her achievements, sort of scholastically, over the next uh, hour or so. Um, and, and a lot of us here know Leila scientifically, and of course, some of you know Leila really well personally. And I think it's my job here before we get started to sort of try and bridge these two kind of different views of Leila to give you a more holistic picture of the person that we're going to be seeing presenting here in a few minutes. <clears throat> before I get started, I just want to give you an idea about what's going on here. In, in a few minutes after I'm done introducing Leila, well, she's going to present her, her dissertation and most of the work that she's been doing over the last four and a half years in, in about 50 minutes or so. After that, her presentation is going to be open for questions from everyone here. And then shortly after that, we're going to have a closed session with just Lila's uh, evaluation committee and Lila. And that's going to take typically less than two hours. We'll see how it goes. And then after that, uh, we, we're done, hopefully ready to celebrate. Uh, just very briefly about Lila, this is a, this is a, a really full of Lila. And I will say that I, I've, of course, done some research uh, on Lila's background. And I will not reveal any sources. That's sort of part of the deal. I, I, I protect my sources. Right? And anonymy is really, really important here. Uh, Lila got a BA from Smith College back in 2009. Uh, she got uh, a master's at BIMS in 2014, and then she joined the PhD program here in 2015. And I'll talk a little bit about what led up to her entering the program and, and some of the negotiations that Lila and I went through before she got here. Uh, through this time, Lila also managed to travel a lot and, and do some humanitarian work. She spent time in Norway, in Nepal, a bit, and, and a few other places, I can't remember. So, so she's been around. And it's probably no surprise to anyone here that through her academic career, uh, Lila has, has maintained really, really excellent scores and grades, and she's just been an outstanding scholar. And the question, of course, is, you know, where did her, her interest in, in sort of natural sciences and biology come from? And uh, Lila grew up spending weekends, sorry, canoeing, hiking, skiing, spending time in the outdoors with her family, and I think that's probably uh, a big part of, of why we're here today. Uh, she also spent the summers camping most of the coast of Maine, so that perhaps explains some of the, the interest for, for the marine side of things. And apparently it wasn't until uh, sometime during the college years that Leila really honed in on, on marine sciences and, and sort of open water biology. And, and if, if what I've heard is correct, then it was this one particular research cruise that, that Leila participated in as a student that sort of cemented her interest in, in open water biology. And I think for us, that's really important to recognize this is early formative kind of events for students that, that can shape the rest of their careers. Now, 
This was not the only interest thing that had. <clears throat> she also had an interest in sort of more of the performance. <laughs> and, uh, and she actually comes from a family of uh, sort of artistically gifted people. Uh, her brother is a Nova Saint, so in training, and apparently both her parents are quite gifted in that area also. And I have from, uh, from, from insights, and again, I cannot disclose the source of information here, that of course, with that background in the family, there were high hopes for Leila to also excel in that part of, of, of her life. So there was this quest for finding um, sort of an artistic uh, outlet or an artistic talent for Leila. And she was placed in, she was actually placed in piano lessons. <laughs> Good. And, and uh, I don't know how to say this, you know, as a parent, of course, we always look at our children and we have a hard time seeing faults in them. You know, we idolize the children, everything they do is amazing. Uh, and, and to a fault, actually, because, you know, we have these generations of people now going up and expecting a medal for pretty much time, the shoelaces and stuff, right? So, so it's hard as a parent to, to, to deal with this tough love, but of course it is important, right? And I think what I'm going to tell you next sort of it should be viewed in that perspective. Because again, I have it from insiders that after listening to Leila practice piano at home for a little over a year, uh, her parents agreed that this, this was going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they, they, they were basically, and I, I really admire this, they were, they were upfront and honest with Leila about this, and they told her this, this, that's the end of that, this is not, this is not happening. <laughs> And again, I, I really admire the honesty. It's sort of on the brutal side, but you know, like you lead it all through, and, and here we are today. So I, I think I think you know what I'm through this is good, right? Now, I think perhaps some of that sent Leela into this uh, sort of spiral. Uh, you know, she had she, she did another outlet. So Leela is obviously a very gifted athlete. She spent four years in university soccer. Uh, she played basketball. She was a state track champion, half mile in freshman year. She wrote first boat as a senior. So very, very accomplished athlete. You know, she still, she still, uh, she still is. She still works out. You can see that here. here. There's often a gun show going on in the lab. And Leila has also been known to sort of pick up pretty much any member of the of the lab at any time. So, so, so still very much an athlete. Um, uh, but also, but also a scholar. Now I want to get back to when when Nila and I first met. <laughs> and as any good as any good uh, prospective graduate student, Nila reached out to me well before application deadlines. And this is this may not be the photo from our first call, but it's it's around that time. And to the younger people, the undergrads in the audience, this is actually a phone. <laughs> Anyway, we, we had these conversations about, you know, you know, Lita first hit me and her email and she explained what she'd been doing and what her interests were. And there was, there was fish in there, there was environment in there. So I'm like, oh, this is cool. I can, I can work with this. And we're going back and forth and back and forth. And I also said fish when I talked to Lita. So we, we kept talking. And then at some point, this is an email from, from January 3rd. And it's a long email, so I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. <laughs> So this experimental stuff sounds cute, and I should say I'm an experimental biologist. That's what I do. I live in the lab. I do controlled experiments, and that's where I'm comfortable. Okay? So anyway, Lila, she wanted to sail into the sunset on a beautiful ocean and tag big fish and see what they're up to. Right? And uh, and we've been going back and forth like this for a while. Like you know, that's not really what I do, but I really want to do this. That this was kind of so. It took me four days to respond to this email, and that alone is not a good sign. And here's here's my response, or part of my response. I'm not opposed to field component and modeling aspects of your dissertation. And then, then there's however. Remember how if there's a however or a but in any paragraph, anything before that really doesn't count, right? <laughs> so this is what matters. I have to be completely honest. This is not what you're funny to do. It's far outside what I'm comfortable with. And uh, I have a hard time seeing how this should really relate to anything. And to, just to make sure that that hit home, I continued later in this email by saying, if you're really passionate about fieldwork and modeling, there are other professors at Masters, I suggest you, uh, I can suggest a potential advisors. I'd really hate to see you engage in work that you're not truly passionate about. And that is me saying, it's my way or the highway. Like, most people in here know that now. Um, so, that's how we started off. Lila accepted, and in her personal statement, when she applied for the program, which is sort of making it official, she said, yeah, I'm really excited about physiology and behavior, and this is gonna teach me a lot, and, and it was great. <laughs> 
So Lila was accepted into the program. And it went really well. So this is Lila in the lab with, you see, I mean, a lab coat, no, that would never happen, but at least gloves <laughs> in this case. And she's doing experimental work under very controlled conditions. And in fact, this is a Faraday cage that sort of basically is supposed to eliminate any outside influence on what you're doing, right? So this is, this is my kind of work. Like very one parameter, we see what happens, we ask a question, we answer that question, we move on. Simple, safe, I'm happy. <laughs> and this is again a little more of that stuff. And, and it actually, it, it works. I'm not just, they got excited about this. I think that's, that's, that's fair to say. So when you, when you get a data, data trace like that, a lot of us, a lot of the scientists in here can, can truly relate to that reaction. It is super satisfying, right? And again, it's in the lab, it's controlled, you get that bleep in the curve, you know what it means, everybody's happy, right? And data was too, I'm like, this is good, I got her, but you should never cage a wild bird. <laughs> <laughs> and so during the first year or two of her PhD at Rasmus, she kept nagging me about this tagging stuff. And that's exactly what she's doing here, you know, the, it, just, it, just, it never stopped. It was in a very respectful way, but it, all, it just never stopped. And eventually, I got to admit, she kind of she chipped away at me enough, so I'm like, I started thinking about this. And before I knew it, I find myself uh, rewriting proposals, rebudgeting funds, taking money away from collaborators at other universities <laughs> to fuel this desire for running out and taking these fish. And we ended up doing that. And, and I, I, I got to say that I'm glad we did that. It, you know, we, we pulled in a lot of other people. And it's hard work. It's, it's, you're out on the water, and it's like it's sunny and stuff. <laughs> like this, this John and Ron is in here, it's CJ and Justin, you know, we all had to go out and fuel this passion of Lila's for, for taking these big beautiful fish in the ocean. And, uh, and you know, the struggle is real. And this actually is, this is my favorite picture, of, one of my favorite pictures of Lila. And this is the second biggest grin I've ever seen in her face. This is from 80 miles out in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the conditions, they're not, they're not possible. But this is really where Lila sort of is at home. I, I, I will say, caught Marty was there and tagged him, uh, but Leah then insisted that we go out further to one of these rigs, and then we had to catch these two nose. It was awful. But as I say, I really want to thank you for dragging me into this. This is uh, this is the first photo of uh, a tag Marty that's been held for 24 hours after tagging in captivity, just prior to its release. Uh, Leah will talk about some of the data that came out of the study. And, and I think what we've, what we've managed to do, and again, thank you, Leila, is combining Leila's passion for sticking fish or tags in these fish and seeing what they do with my sort of tendency to, to manipulate and do experimental work. We've done that. And it's been amazing. Leila will be talking about it. So thank you. Um, I will say a lot of people have, of course, been dragged into this and have been involved. And I, I have a pretty good feeling about today's defense. Of course, that's, you know, that's never a guarantee. And I, I want to come back to this whole performing arts thing for Leela. Just in case things do not work out today, there, there definitely is hope for, for an alternative career for Leela. And so she, there's definitely a flair for dramatic here. And, 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 uh, and it, it, this is very recent, actually. You know, it's, like it, it's still happening. It started early, and it's, you know, it's, it's a persistent thing in Leela. And I think, I, think, I think it's good. And you know, whether there's scope for career in this. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to be Josh. As I said, I think there's a pretty good chance we won't have to go that route. This is this is a sort of a list of what we really consider accomplishments in, in academia and in science. These are Lila's publications up until now. And um, Lila is going to be talking about 
sort of the top part of this work here over the next hour or so. So I think without too much further ado, I want to show this photo of Lila, which is, that's the biggest, but remember I said the second biggest friend I've ever seen this, but this is the biggest. And this is taken exactly four weeks ago when Lila uh, submitted her dissertation prior to this defense. And I hope we're going to see a smile like that later today. Thanks, Lila. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, for that introduction. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here today. It's awesome to see everybody. Um, so the title of my dissertation is The Effect of Environmental Variables and Anthropogenic Foods on the Physiology of Behavior of Green Fishes. I'd like to start today actually thinking about a theoretical fish. And it's appropriate that Martin introduced me because you all knew you were coming for a science talk, but you didn't realize you were going to get in an art show as well. Um, <laughs> So fish move through their environment with finely tuned sensory apparatus that allow them to see, smell, taste, um, and sense the environment around them. And that's um, important because all fish need to do a few things in order to be successful. So the one thing they have to avoid creation, they have to uh, catch sufficient numbers of prey fish, and they have to reproduce. And they have to do all of that um, within very specific requirements for temperature, oxygen, and in some cases, salinity. And certain species also have very important requirements for habitat. And environmental variables like light availability can change the way they perceive their environment and uh, modify how, how well they are able to avoid creation or catch Things like toxicants in the environment can also alter their behavior and alter their so I like to just start with this framework and considering all the different aspects that we're going to talk to deal with. I think that's really important because the environment is changing and it's changing rapidly. So um, you're seeing on the left side images from the most recent IPCC report showing that the surface of the ocean has already warmed a considerable amount and is projected to warm as much as four degrees Celsius in the next few years. We also know that the surface pH of the ocean is dropping and things like overfishing and habitat degradation from trawling are further modifying the ocean, as well as uh, one-time large-scale pollution events like the deep water horizon oil spill that happened in 2010. So today we're going to talk about everything from um, neurons and what they can sense in the environment up to the movements of uh, big, beautiful fish like these mommy. Um, and so I'd like to frame this conversation today um, just through using the lens of physiology uh, to examine the link between the environmental variables and the behavior of many species. I'm going to be focusing today on two main stressors um, crude oil from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, as many of you know, this was a devastating environmental uh, tragedy that occurred in 2010 and released nearly 5 million barrels of crude oil into the Northern Gulf of Mexico, as well as warming sea surface temperatures that are affecting um, many species of marine fish. So my first chapter um, uses a delightful charismatic species called the bicolor gazelfish, and um, I was interested in whether or not they would avoid an alarm cue, whether oil exposure would uh, modify that behavior, and if they can detect an alarm cue as a refractory cue, and whether oil affects their detection of that cue. I also um, focus for um, two of my chapters on mahi mahi, and use juvenile mahi mahi to look at whether um, these fish could sense and avoid crude oil, and whether a previous oil exposure would affect either their behavior or their ability to detect that cue at the olfactory of the human. And then finally, we tagged big, beautiful fish in the sunset. Um, and I wanted to look at how environmental variables um, affect the migrations, habitat use, and activity of wild mahi mahi. So I'll start with a little bit of background on olfaction since that's a major part of my dissertation. So um, fish can smell, they can smell very well. They have a in-current and an ex-current air. And essentially the water flows in and out, and while it's doing that, it's going over this 
uh, surface, which is called the olfactory epithelium. This surface is covered in all these different lamellae you can kind of see in this photo are covered in olfactory sensory neurons. Mahi Mahi actually has 32,000 olfactory sensory neurons per square millimeter in their olfactory epithelium. So, um, sense of smell is very important for many species of fish. Everything from migration, spawning, assessing uh, habitat quality, all kinds of things. So, the neurons that cover this surface, um, you can see just a schematic of them here. They basically uh, bind molecules floating through the water, and there's a variety of events that happen after that binding. But the end result is that uh, negatively charged chloride ions leave the cell. And because of that um, change in voltage, you can actually measure that at the olfactory of the helium using an electrode placed um, just on the surface. And you can measure that efflux of negatively charged ions as a proxy for what these fish can detect at the olfactory of the helium. Of course, because these neurons are directly exposed to the environment, they're able to pick up on cues in the environment very rapidly. And that's part of what makes olfaction um, such an important sense. But it also means that they're directly exposed to any toxins in the water. So crude oil, for example, is going to be directly washing over the neurons. Because of this, um, researchers have looked into the effects of oil exposure on olfaction. Um, and studies going back to the 70s and 80s have shown that multi-day exposures to crude oil can cause necrosis and lesions on the olfactory epithelium. Um, a very recent study last year was the first to use this um, technique that I just mentioned in the previous slide, which is called the electro olfactory technique, measuring the voltage change at the olfactory epithelium, to assess the effects of crude oil, and they found reduced detections of the olfactory epithelium in the lens stains. We've seen behavioral effects, so reef fish exposed to crude oil have shown uh, reduced settling and anti predator behavior. And then finally, in larval mahi mahi, gene expression data has, has shown us that um, oil exposure can cause degradation in the central nervous system. So we know there's a lot of components going on when fish are exposed to crude oil, um, and we have some evidence that things like olfaction behavior and central nervous system processing are affected. But one of the biggest and most common effects of oil exposure um, that's very well studied in the literature and in our group is uh, effects on cardiac physiology. So, um, some work by Rachel Ware and colleagues showed that cardiomyocytes that are taken from monkey monkey parts here um, have reduced contraction after exposure to oil compared to control cardiomyocytes. When you scale that up to the whole organ level, you see work by uh, Derek Nelson and colleagues um, in the in situ part of a monkey monkey after oil exposure, there's reduced cardiac output. Of course, when you have reductions in um, cardiac capacity, uh, you expect reductions in swimming speed, and that's exactly what we see. Work by John Stieglitz and colleagues showed that oil exposed fish over here have reduced maximum sustained swimming speed. So, all of these effects taken together suggest a profound loss of fitness for fish that are exposed to oil in the wild. But um, that's all these experiments to date have been done in the lab, and so that's something that hasn't uh, yet been examined. And that's what led us uh, on a crazy adventure in the Gulf of Mexico, where we oil exposed fish on the back of the wall and Smith, tag them, and release them. And I won't be talking about that today, unfortunately, but stay tuned for that in the future. But that's what led us down this path of using pop up satellite archival tags to track the behavior of fish in the wild. So we realized we didn't know enough about the behavior of control mahi mahi under regular conditions and how they interact with the environment. And so we needed to do a control study first. So these tags are one of the few ways you can assess the behavior of a migratory species at liberty. And they allow close examinations of migrations, the habitat use, um, and response to environmental variables that are really important for managing populations. So we've seen a lot of shifts in species due to ocean warming. And pelagic fish have not received a lot of the um, a lot of the focus of some of this research until very recently and some recent papers have shown that species like swordfish and different species of tunas are actually starting to shift forward. So we know that mahi mahi, many of us think about as a good sustainable fishery. And some recent evidence um, suggests potentially that their populations may be declining. So using tags like this to look at their interaction with the environment um, and how they respond to environmental variables is becoming more and more relevant. So we're going to dive right into chapter one, 
So the questions for chapter one were whether bipolar damselfish respond behaviorally to a conspecific alarm cue, whether they detect that alarm cue as an olfactory cue, and whether either behavior, behavioral or olfactory response is affected by oil exposure. The reason that we chose bipolar damselfish, and you can see them here, they are a reef species that once they settle to their reef, um, they defend that territory and they stay right, right at that reef. <coughs> So these species are common in the Gulf of Mexico where the oil spill occurred, and they would have been affected by the spill because they're not really able to just go choose another reef. They're, they're stuck where they are. We also know that many species of damselfish um, respond to this conspecific alarm cue that I'll talk about in a moment. So we wanted to see whether this species that we have locally as well would respond to the cue. So this conspecific alarm cue, also known as Shrek stuff, which is, uh, means fear matter or fear substance, um, was first described in 1938. And basically what happens is when a predator, I can't claim credit for that artwork, by the way, but um, <laughs> that was done by an actual child. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so when a predator uh, has an attempted predation event or an actual predation event and breaks the skin of a crayfish, molecules float through the water column, they're picked up at the olfactory epithelium of conspecific, uh, conspecific fish, and then there's a variety of downstream processes through the central nervous system that elicit a fear response. Um, and so this is important, right? Because these fish, they're afraid, they know to hide, they hopefully don't get eaten like their poor friend. Um, so this is the framework that I was considering for these experiments. Is if we see a behavioral response, and if that behavioral response is affected by ex exposure to a, a toxin, we need to evaluate where along the chain this is happening. So is the injury happening at the sensory side, so are fish less able to sense this alarm cue, or is it downstream and it's a central nervous system processing problem? And so that led us to a two-part approach. These are um, the methods that we use for this first, that I used for this first experiment. So this is the two-channel flume. So this is a behavioral assay um, where we have gravity-fed streams of water say seawater and water spikes with an alarm cue, and that flows down into um, this flume that has laminar separation. And you simply assess which side of the flume the fish spends its time on. And so look at the olfactory physiology. I use this technique that I've mentioned called the electro olfactogram technique that measures that voltage change when a cue is delivered at the olfactory feeling. These were lab experiments, and so we use lab-based oil exposures. This is, um, you can see it's a little dark, but this is the crude oil that is collected from the Deepwater Horizon spill, and we have a fridge full of it in the lab. We blend that with seawater, which makes this 100% oil solution here. That settles for an hour, and then we can dilute that to a, uh, a known volume. So you'll hear me talk about 2% and 6% exposures. And we can keep these fish for 24 hours. Um, we use these industrial pickle jars as experimental tanks. Um, and then, of course, we take samples to measure exactly what we've exposed the fish to. So this is an example from um, the damselfish work, where you can see 50 different PAHs that are measured very precisely for their concentration. Crude oil, of course, is a mixture of many different compounds. It's very complicated. But um, we measure these 50 that are suggested by the EPA. And their different uh, grain class structures are up at the top. So for example, this, you'll see this notation throughout the presentation. This um, particular sample had a concentration of 37 micrograms per liter, and that's the sum of the concentration of each of these 50 pAHs. For context, in the Gulf of Mexico, after the spill, we had anywhere from about 0 to 85 micrograms per liter, with an average of 22 micrograms per liter. So you can keep that in context as we go through, um, but all the exposures that you'll see are environmentally relevant with that. Uh, range in mind. So we used bipolar um, damselfish from right off Key Biscayne that we caught using scuba. Um, and we had two different groups of controls. So seawater on both sides of the flume, which is just to establish whether or not there was any side bias in these experiments. And then we used um, seawater with the alarm cube on the opposite side of the flume. We had a group of oil exposed fish, so they were oil exposed for 24 hours to 6% oil. And we tested these fish immediately after exposure, and then also after we let them recover for three days, and then a total of eight days. Here is what we found with that experiment. So 
you're looking at the different treatment groups on the x-axis and then the percent time in the ORMQ on the y-axis. So this dashed line is right at 50%, which is just showing you what you would expect the behavior to be if the fish has no preference about which set of pollutants on. And that is coincidentally, or not coincidentally, right where our negative control fish came in. So they didn't show any side bias in these experiments. You can see that our control fish are avoiding this alarm cue, so they do show that avoidance response coming in just about 17% of their time in the alarm cue. However, after oil exposure, we see that the fish are no longer avoiding the alarm cue. And surprisingly, even after eight days of recovery in clean water, they don't restore it. They don't recover that ability to avoid the cue. So again, these fish here in the oil exposed group, they're not attracted to the ORMQ, but they're showing no preference. They're coming in right at about 50%. So next, I wanted to see whether or not this avoidance was based on detection of the ORMQ and whether that uh, detection was being injured by that exposure to oil. So we used um, five colors from the same reef, um, and we had 14 controls and 11 oil exposed. And this was a blind experiment, so I had uh, helpers in the lab that would bring me a fish and I didn't know whether or not it had been uh, control or oil exposed treatment. So there's no bias there. So I removed the septum just simply to expose the olfactory epithelium and then measure the voltage change across the olfactory epithelium um, while cues are delivered. So I know this photo comes out a bit dark, but this is the perfusal um, tube. So this is delivering seawater to perfuse the olfactory epithelium. This is the electrode that's resting on the olfactory epithelium, and then this is a control electrode that's just in the skin of the fish. So I used cues randomly delivered um, every 90 seconds, and they were followed by a matching blank or just a seawater cue, and that cue, that line was subtracted from the response. So alarm cue, of course, and then two different dilutions of l alanine which is a proxy for a prey cue, a brine shrimp rinse, because that's what you're feeding a fish in the lab, a dilution of that fried shrimp rinse, and then um, torquilaric acid, which is a bile salt um, and represents an alarm cue. So just to give you an idea of what these uh, responses look like, this is the zero line here. So you're just seeing um, no, no response when just seawater is washing over the epithelium. When that cue is delivered, you see this change in voltage. And then after the cue is uh, ceased, the fish regains, the, or the neurons regain the uh, neutral resting spot. So the amplitude can be measured from this response, the duration, the area under the curve, the maximum slope, the average slope, any number of things. So these are the these are the parameters that I measured. And then in order to assess which of these would give us the most information about what's going on, I used a, a principal components analysis and selected from that the amplitude and the duration of the response um, because they were giving us different types of information and weren't correlated with one another. Right. So this is the amplitude data. Um, you see the cues down on the x-axis, and then the amplitude in millivolts is here on the y-axis. So just to orient you, um, control fish are in blue, oil exposed are in yellow. And you can just see here in the um, response to alanine, this is the stronger concentration. You see a smaller response with the weaker concentration. So fewer molecules to bind, you see um, less of a voltage change. However, we didn't see a significant difference in the response um, between control and oil exposed fish. And similarly, similarly with the duration, although there does appear to be you know, quite a big difference here, there was so much variation that these um, differences weren't statistically significant. So one of the things you'll notice um, is that some of these cues are actually going down below the zero line. And what that means is that these cues are very close to the edge of detection. And so there are some positive detections of the cue mixed in with negative detections or fish that aren't detecting the cue. So the, these three cues were very weakly detected and kind of represent um, cues that were right on their threshold of what they could pick up and or what the technique is capable of picking up. So I wanted to look further into that and separate out some of the variability and look at fish that were responders and non-responders to the cues. So I did that with all three of the cues um, that were weakly detected. But I only saw a difference with this conspecific alarm cue, where I do see um, reduced detections by oil exposed fish compared to control fish. You'll see that we did just, it just escaped statistical significance, um, but we clearly have a reduction in detections in these oil exposed fish. So, to summarize these results, 
Um, our fluid choice experiments suggest that the crude oil exposure modifies either olfaction or central nervous system processing. So we've, we've seen a reduction in the behavior, and at that point, we need to know where it's coming from. We also saw um, effects persisting out to eight days, um, and with no mortality in this group. So we didn't have any, this is truly sub-lethal exposures. We're not seeing any fish um, die as a result of this oil exposure, but they're still having altered behavioral responses out to eight days. And our EMG experiments suggest that um, there is disruption, some disruption of this CAC or alarm cue detection at the olfactory epithelium, um, although we didn't see any evidence for disruption of other cues. So that suggests that potentially the effects of oil exposure may be cue specific. Moving right into chapter two. So this study was done with uh, juvenile mahi mahi, and we wanted to know whether or not these fish would avoid oil if they detected oil as an olfactory cue, and whether a previous oil exposure would affect either their behavioral or olfactory response to food oil. So mahi mahi, um, these are, this is a picture from an experimental hatchery, are um, highly migratory species, and they grow very rapidly. So one of the things that was suggested after the spill is that maybe these fish have simply been able to avoid the oil. Um, that's something we hear a lot, especially from people in the oil industry. <laughs> um, maybe it was fine, maybe they just swam away. Um, so that's, that's what motivated this study, is to look at whether or not that um, was the case. So the literature is full of some interesting papers on the effect of pHs on, on behavior. So I know, um, we know that American lobster are actually attracted to whole kerosene, and for a while, um, fishermen in some parts of the country were using kerosene to soak bricks as lobster bait. Um, thankfully, they don't do that anymore. Um, and some species of fish have been shown to avoid sediments that are contaminated with crude oil. But we've also seen studies that have shown a certain species that avoids a certain type of oil mixed into the sediment won't avoid another type of oil. Uh, and we know that when oil is mixed into seawater, in the species where it has been tested in pink salmon, Caspian roach, and the European sea bass, all these species have shown avoidance, but at vastly different thresholds. So uh, European sea bass are the most sensitive species, tested at think, around 8 micrograms per liter, whereas pink salmon are up at about 200 micrograms per liter. So that's, that's a really different exposure threshold uh, for avoidance. So understanding the behavior of fish in response to pHs is really critical. Um, when you think about an oil spill, it's not homogeneous. So there's different concentrations of oil in different places, and it's really essential to understand what fish were exposed to. So what, knowing what their behavior is going to be in response to that oil is critical for that. So again, um, this is very similar methodology to the previous chapter. So in this two-channel flume, um, we used, instead of the alarm cue, we used a dilution of crude oil in the flume. So it'll be seawater on one side and then a dilution of oil on the other. And then um, similarly with the electro factory technique, I used crude oil as one of the cues. So these were uh, juvenile mahi mahi raised in the external hatchery um, for the behavior experiment from 18 to 30 days. I get three groups of previously unexposed mahi mahi. So one of those groups, again, is tested with seawater on both sides of the flume to evaluate whether there was a side bias. And then we tested those unexposed fish with a 2% oil on one side and a different group with 6% oil cue on one side. And then we had a group of oil exposed mahi mahi that we again exposed to oil, similarly to the fish for 24 hours to a 6% oil. And then we tested those fish with a 6% oil cue. So the behavior assay we found, um, again, this graph is very similar to the one you've just seen, but the percent time in the queue and then the concentration of oil in the flume at the bottom. So our control fish in blue, the fish that were tested with seawater on both sides of the flume, come in right at 50%, so they're not showing any side bias. When you add a 2% oil queue to the flume, those control fish do spend slightly less time in it. But uh, when you get up to this higher concentration queue, 6% oil, did you see significant avoidance? So they're behaving significantly differently than the fish with no oil in the flume. In contrast, um, after 24 hour oil exposure, we see that these fish are no longer avoiding oil cube. So with the EOG methods, again, very similar to the last chapter, these, um, these mahi mahi were again raised at uh, experimental hatchery 
for 33 to 50 days post hatch. We did 12 oil exposed and 12 control fish. Again, a 24 hour oil exposure, and the cues were delivered as before every 90 seconds in a random order um, using oil, two dilutions of the L alanine um, food pellet extract. So, this was from the food pellet that they were being fed at the after the time, a dilution of that food pellet extract, and then again, the torchloric acid, which is an alarm cue. So, this data. Um, is the uh, amplitude data, just as I showed you before, for the damsel fish with cues on the bottom. This PT is the pellet and the dilution of the pellet. Um, and then this, the amplitude on the y axis. So, similarly, we see that a stronger concentration of L alanine and a weaker, have a stronger, weaker response, as you would expect. Um, but we don't see any difference between the control and the oil exposed. Very similar for the duration. In contrast to the damselfish data that I showed you, you notice that these barbs are nearly identical between the two groups. So that was a bit surprising. Um, but we, I did notice, uh, although again, I didn't see any significant differences, that the coefficient of variation for these weakly detected cues was actually two times greater in the oil exposed fish than it was in the controls. So while that doesn't suggest there's a significant difference in detection, it does suggest that there may be some mechanisms happening at the epithelium that could be contributing to altered decision making, potentially. So in these experiments, um, our food choice results showed that control maki maki will avoid the higher concentration of oil in the flume, while the oil exposed maki did not. And this suggests, again, that this oil exposure that we see modifying behavior is either modifying central nervous system processing or the detection. And the EOG data confirms that this um, their olfaction is actually not impaired after 24 hours of oil exposure. And I just realized I neglected to mention it, but um, I do want to point out that they were actually smelling the oil cue. Um, so we're confirming that they they do smell the oil, and that's probably contributing to their avoidance in the control fish, but not obviously in oil exposed individuals. There's something else going on, and that's something else um, based on our process of elimination is likely central nervous system processing problems resulting from oil exposure. So this sounds like good news that they avoid oil, that's great. Um, but unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. So this is uh, some work by Ed Nager and colleagues in 2014, showing that basically this exact same life stage of Mahi Mahi, exposed to very similar concentration of crude oil, so just this bar over here, they have a reduction in maximum sustained swimming speed. So this is the same concentration of oil um, that they do avoid However, avoidance in this case still means they're spending 36% of their time in the queue. So that avoidance is probably not really going to save them from some of these deleterious physiological effects. And again, previously, um, previously exposed maki maki are going to continue to experience exposure because they lose that avoidance behavior. So this has uh, implications for the exposure burden that maki maki likely face after the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Moving on to chapter three. So for this chapter, I wanted to look at how environmental variables affected the activity of vertical and horizontal migration of wild maki maki. And another part of this project um, was trying to figure out how we can improve techniques that have been used previously with maki maki to increase tag retention in these, in these fish. So if you haven't had the chance to see wild maki maki, um, it's pretty incredible. They are ferocious, uh, they're feisty, they're fast, they're amazing to watch in the water. So these are some flying fish um, that probably wish they were having a slightly different outcome to their day. Um, but mahi mahi are pursued all over the world as a commercial and recreational sports species. Um, they taste delicious, they're, and they're fun to fish for. Because they're so fast and they're so, they get so amped up over their prey, they're also um, very easily stressed. And so that becomes part of the issue with tagging these fish and releasing them in healthy conditions. You have to be very, very careful to not stress them. Um, they're not quite as hardy as some of the other pelagics. Um, you can see just how active these fish are and how fast they are. And so understanding their migrations and their movements and their activity is really central to understanding the ecology of these fish. So I don't think it ends very well for these flying fish. <laughs> so 
Using pop-up satellite archival tags is one of the ways, as I've mentioned, to study these fish in their natural environment. This is what the tag looks like on the applicator, going into the fish, and then on a free-swimming fish. Tags can be captured data in five minutes, and they collect light levels at sunrise and sunset along with sea surface temperature data to model estimated locations on uh, a twice daily basis. And you can program these tags to pop up after a scheduled number of days. Um, and they can transmit the data remotely to passing satellites um, that you can then download. So there's no need to recapture the fish or the tag. So I mentioned we were also really interested in the activity of these fish. Um, and one of the issues um, with acceleration data is that it is uh, collected at a very high rate, and that makes it difficult or impossible to transmit through the satellite. So there's sort of a bottleneck of how much data you can actually transmit successfully. So recently, accelerometers have been integrated into pop-up tags, but there's still that bottleneck effect where people have been forced to basically try to find a way to collect the tag at the end or um, recapture the fish in some way. And that's really not an option in Monty because they move so quickly. So we, talked, we started talking to wildlife computers that makes these tags um, and we decided to collaborate with them on a project to come up with a way to summarize this acceleration data in a way that could be transmitted to the satellites, but would also still give us really important information about the behavior of these fish. So what they came up with um, is, is this idea of these uh, low activity events and the high activity events. And so the acceleration data is collected by the tag once per second, and then it's summarized. So in an 11 second sliding window, the tag knows the maximum and the minimum value within that time. And essentially, the difference between those two exceeds a particular threshold that's considered a high activity event. And if it doesn't exceed the threshold, it's a low activity event. These counts are summarized in two hour time bits. Um, so the question, of course, is where to set that threshold. And that obviously depends a lot on the species. And so that's why we started. Um, with a, with a project to first tag fish in captivity so that we could assess this question. So these are wild-caught mahi-mahi that had been brought in from the Florida Straits a few weeks prior to this first experiment. And um, we, this is the tag here. You can see the sensors and the tag dart. So we use, a, we use an antibiotic when we do this just to promote the healing of the tag site. And then we just simply herded some of these fish into sling push the tag dart to the dorsal musculature, and then move these fish into a 30,000 liter tank that had um, video cameras. So there was many reasons for this experiment. The first was to examine basically the behavior of the fish post tagging, make sure that they weren't um, stressed, that they were feeding regularly. Um, we also wanted to look at that activity threshold, as I mentioned, and we were really curious about the idea of using this information from the tags, if we could predict spawning. Now, uh, this is um, footage from a spawning event. Um, you can see in the timestamp what time they typically choose, which is not terribly convenient, but you've got to work with that. Um, so, in just a minute, you're going to see actually the release of gametes from one of the fish, well, two of the fish, that's how it works. Um, but here you see the female releasing eggs and the male coming behind to fertilize. So, we, we did this experiment twice, um, which turned out not to be. The best plan, but um, never repeat a good experiment. Um, but we have a, we have data from um, a total of five captive fish at this point and 32 uh, cumulative spawning events. And uh, so that's you can think to yourself how many nights I spent perfecting outside their tank waiting for them to spawn. But the next step after completing those experiments was to look um, look into tagging some fish in the wild. So I dragged Martin out of the lab. Um, and off we went. So this is, we bring, um, when we're on the Walton Smith, we bring fish in via yeah, a sling and immediately immerse these fish in a, in a tank of seawater or a cooler. We have an oxygen stone in there and a pump so that we can ventilate the fish. Um, we do a pretty quick workup. So this is a fish again that's still submerged and ventilated. We're taking a fin clip, we've just finished measuring. This gives us a good opportunity to assess the fish, make sure there's no wounds, no bleeding. Um, this was from our cruise in June, so we've got a lot of equipment on the back deck. And then um, 
you can get a good look at this right here. So you can see the see the pump ventilating the fish there. So the tag goes into the dorsal musculature, and then we give these fish just another quick look over and put them into one of our recovery tanks. So this is one of the ways that we've tried to improve the tag retention in this species that has um, historically been a challenge for people trying to tag them, is we use these large um, recovery tanks to give them a chance to recover from angling, tagging, um, and just kind of protect them in that window where they're likely more vulnerable to predators. So we've got this fish going in, and there's oxygen and air bubbling through this tank. So to, for this project, we have now um, have data from 19 tagged Mahi Mahi, 17 of them in the Florida Straits, two in the Gulf of Mexico, and a pretty good split between males and females, ranging in size from 65 up to about 120 centimeters for length. And the tag retention um, varies, but we've, we've had tag retention up to 48 days, which is great. So we don't always have access to those large recovery tanks. So this is a picture actually in the Gulf of Mexico where we tagged fish boat side and release them immediately. So this is where this comparison comes from. And it's a pretty small sample size that we have not been able to recover. Um, you can see that it does appear that the recovery time assists us with um, getting some good tag retention. I think in particular, it really helps for the fish that may have been uh, created upon soon after release. So it gives them that time to recover. And this is an image just from one of our recovery tanks. So the thing that does cut short these tagging um, deployments. In previous studies, it's been unclear whether there was tag shedding going on, whether the tags were causing some sort of stress to the fish. And what we've concluded um, that other studies have not really looked into is that predation is a huge part of the life of a mahi mahi. So this is an example of a, the fish that was predated on, where you see normal mahi behavior up here, and then something drastic changes. <laughs> um, and so there's many ways that you can assess whether or not a predation event has occurred. It's not always a clear behavioral shift like this, where you see something that you know could not possibly be a lot of money. But you also, because the tag has light sensors, you can look and see uh, how, when the light disappears, you know that that tag is now in the stomach of something. So that gives you a hard and fast way to determine that. And we've seen that um, many of our fish, it's possible to say exactly what ended the deployment, and in most cases, it is a predation event. And we know um, also that Mahi Mahi naturally have a very short life lifetime, so they don't live free, frequently a one-year-old fish is as old as it gets, and they, they very rarely live past two years old. So by the time they're large enough for us to tag them, they are already close to the end of their life, and so that seems to be one of the consequences of, of working with these fish. So in this case, it's hard to say for sure, but we suspect potentially a, a six-gill shark may have been what ended this little guy. But we're getting some incredible data back from these tags despite these predation events. So we have most of our fish, of course, tagged right off of Miami. You can see that some of these fish are doing migrations of up to 100 kilometers a day, which is a lot of swimming, also considering that they're moving up and down in the water column while they do this. So most, almost all of these fish migrated northward initially. We had one, one male that took a quick spin down south before moving northward. And our fish in the Gulf of Mexico, um, we didn't have terribly long deployments for either of those fish, but they did remain in the Gulf of Mexico during their tagging. This dashed lines here are just showing these regions um, that I've defined and I'll talk about a little later. So this is the Gulf of Mexico region, the southern Gulf Stream, the mid Gulf Stream, and the north Gulf Stream region. I'm going to show you some information on the depth distribution of these fish, their temperature distribution, and then the effect of light, both sunlight and moonlight, on their depth and activity. And some very preliminary predictions of spawning events. So this, I mentioned, the reason I said we don't, <laughs> don't repeat a good experiment is that this, um, my committee knows that I presented some uh, spawning models in the past that we were really excited about, and then we wanted to increase the sample size, and the data got a lot more complicated. So we've been struggling with um, these predictions of spawning events, um, but I do have some preliminary data very hot off the press that I'm excited to share with everyone. So in the life of a Mahi Mahi, you see them much of the time at the surface. So this is a histogram of the depth distribution for all of the tagged fish. So this is um, 
zero meters from the surface, right at the surface. You see that's where they're spending most of their time. They do get as deep as 250 meters, but that's a pretty rare event. This data does look a little bit more interesting, though, when you look at this by day and night time. So this is just one individual fish, and the gray bars are nighttime period, the white bars are daytime period. You can see they have a very different behavior at nighttime. They're going deeper, they're moving up and down on the water column. And when we looked across all species, or sorry, all of the fish that we tagged, we did see that pattern persist. So um, this is the distribution of time at nighttime and at daytime. And you can see that these, these bars on the nighttime side are, are certainly larger, except up at the surface. One of the other things that I started noticing looking into this data was the potential effect of moon phase. So this is just from one individual fish. We have depth on the y-axis, days on the x-axis, and then the temperatures are color-coded with um, warmer temperatures in yellow. Um, and the black line represents the moon phase. So this here, this is full moon and then new moon, the phases in between. So although it's a little bit messy, it does look like these fish are more surface-oriented at the full moon and a little bit deeper than the moon. So I wanted to look into that more. These are their temperature distributions, and while you can see that they are capable of occupying a wide range of temperatures, um, the median temperature is right at 27.5, which also happens to be where we know from lab work, um, work that Rachel has done, that this is where their aerobic scope is maximized. So we know that this is where they are physiologically um, most efficient, and it also happens to be where they spend the most time in the wild, which I don't believe is a coincidence. So this is just, um, so you can see as these fish migrate through these different regions, so again, Gulf of Mexico, Southern Gulf Stream, Mid Gulf Stream, and Northern Gulf Stream, they're actually maintaining a really consistent median temperature despite migrating through these different regions. So you can actually just draw a line across and see that they're very consistent. They like that 27.5 degree water. And just to, just to, stress this point. These are the sea surface temperatures from those different regions. So you can see that in the Gulf of Mexico, right at the sea surface, it is hot. It is 30, 31 degrees in the summer when we tag these fish. A little bit cooler off of Miami, not much, and then cooler as you move northward. But still, these fish are selecting this 27.5 degree temperature. And the way that they're doing that is by adjusting their depth. So you can see that um, in the Gulf of Mexico, where it's really, really hot at the surface, the mahi aren't at the surface. They're down a little bit deeper. You can also see that a little bit less profoundly with this fish off of Miami. Um, they have a deeper de de depth distribution than the fish in the more northerly, northerly regions. So we wanted to look into the effect of depth um, on sea surface temperature as well as lunar phase. Um, I did that through a series of models. So this is the model for predicted depths in our mahi mahi. You can see depth on the y-axis going down from the surface to the top. PSAT derived sea surface temperature. So that's basically what the fish measure the sea surface temperature. Um, so anytime the fish is in the top two meters of the water. And then the moon illumination. So this yellow color represents full moon. So when the most light from the moon is available. And the black color represents the new moon when the least amount of lunar light is available. Basically, what you can see um, is a few things. The depth tends to increase as the sea surface temperature increases. And so that I've just shown you. The warmer it is, the deeper the fish are. They're also typically deeper at night than during the day. And we see this really interesting pattern where at night, the brighter it is, they're just a little bit closer to the surface. So that suggests that there is some difference in what they're doing um, at nighttime between uh, different, different light availabilities. I also wanted to look at the activity. So this is information that's derived from the Excel summary of the acceleration data. So this activity index, a score of one means um, the maximum amount of high activity events, while a score of zero is um, no high activity events. And again, you see the PSAT derived sea surface temperature on the x-axis and the lunar light in the colors. So there's some really interesting patterns going on here, particularly with temperature. So again, if you keep in mind that 27.5 degree temperature that I told you that they select and that we know is um, physiologically most efficient for them. You can see that during daytime, 
they're kind of hanging out in about the same place, um, regardless, or sorry, they're, they're having the same amount of activity, regardless of, of moon phase um, at that temperature. And it's, it's about a moderate level of activity. Similarly, we see kind of a similar pattern at night, and um, notice this effect of the full moon on the activity, where that's really increasing the, um, the likelihood of high activity events. So we also looked at the um, data from our captive fish, and of course these fish are kept at 27 degrees, but we noticed that there is an effect of moon phase. So as, um, as we move towards the full moon, these fish, even in the tanks, are much more active than they are at the moon. And we know that these fish are obviously not foraging at night in the tanks, um, so that's a pretty interesting pattern. So wild Mahi Mahi have um, their highest activity actually in cooler sea surface temperatures, kind of an intermediate level of activity in um, about 27 degrees sea surface temperature water. We do see lower activity at higher temperatures, except at night where we have more than three quarters of the illumination. So up here, we do see this increase in activity, which could mean that these fish are taking advantage of um, a little extra light potentially to do some feeding. And again, we saw that same pattern um, in our captive fish where they had increasing activity with increasing moon This is kind of interesting because I started looking into the effects of um, moon phase on fish behavior, and Mahi Mahi actually have the exact opposite behavior from bluefin tuna, swordfish, uh, school sharks, and uh, big eye tuna, which makes sense because those, those species are going deeper uh, at night often to feed on those moons of scale fishes that are coming up. Um, so I think that Mahi Mahi are doing something different than a lot of those other fish. Um, and potentially, we see uh, an effective moon phase on, on their feeding behavior is what I would hypothesize. We know that catch rates of Mahi Mahi um, from studies that have been done of tournament catches are lowest at the new moon. Um, or excuse me, highest at the new moon. <laughs> Set that wrong. Highest at the new moon, which suggests that they're potentially, they're a little bit hungrier and they're more likely to go after the bait. Whereas at full moon, there's decreases in catches which could suggest that they're, um, they're not too hungry, so they're not going to be tempted by people's baits as much. So again, I want to stress that these are preliminary, but um, and very hot off the press. Um, but we do have some results from GAM models use, um, using our captive data set to predict spawning in wild fish. So this is just the, um, the, the predictions of those models and looking at the discrimination between periods when we know the fish are spawning and when they're not spawning. So we do have a good amount of separation, which is good, during the periods where we know the fish were not spawning and when they're spawning. Um, there is some overlap, so these models are certainly not perfect. Um, and, our, and our predictions are on the low side, but that's um, sort of what you would expect working with biological data from fish that are migrating hundreds of kilometers a day. It's bound to be a little bit messy. But we have used this to extrapolate two locations. Um, and so on the left panels, you see the male model. So we have predicted spawning locations here and up off the mid coast. And for females, fewer predicted spawning locations off of the mid coast and off of Miami. So this is, this is exciting and it's still under development, but this, um, this work has never been done before and it should improve our idea of how often and where these fish reproduce and what that means for their the sustainability of the stock. So to summarize um, the results from this chapter, our recovery tanks we do believe are facilitating the release of healthy mahi mahi, and we've had um, um, good luck with using that technique. And mahi are migrating incredibly long distances, so they've earned their reputation as a highly migratory species. But during those long migrations, they're actually maintaining a pretty narrow sort of thermal window, which is interesting. We've seen that their activity and their depth distributions are influenced by light availability and sea surface temperature. And it's very likely, given the fact that these fish spend a high proportion of their time at the surface, that they're already being affected by ocean warming. Um, and that pattern is likely to continue, unfortunately, as sea surface temperatures continue to rise. So I think it's important, um, putting this in perspective, just to think about as we try and sustainably manage marine, marine fish populations into the future, the fish eye perspective and understanding kind of what environmental variables, how they affect the physiology of fish and how that translates into
Because there's one thing for sure that we know, which is the environment is always changing. So the more we understand about everything from the cellular response up to the movements and behaviors of wild fish, uh, the better able we will be to manage them and understand what's going to happen as we continue to change the environment. I have a ton of people to thank. Um, I am so grateful for the community at Rasmus, all the support I've had from everyone here, um, especially uh, my academic committee, Martin, Beth, and Tim, and Joe. Um, I'm very grateful for our Recover Consortium that has been an amazing source of collaboration um, and shenanigans. Um, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative for funding all of this work, um, especially. I would like to thank um, Mike Schmally and Lisa Merrily who um, both taught me what I know about teaching to some extent, as well as my 232 and my Eagle Out, those students. Um, you know, for one class, I got to go to the Pampas and Hannah, and another, I got to go to the Blog Ghost twice, but I, <laughs> I learned a lot in both experiences. Um, I definitely need to thank the Grissel and the Benetti Labs, as well as the University of Miami Experimental Hatchery for everything they do. Um, Captain Sean Lake and the crew of the RV and Smith, as well as various other vessels and captains. Um, I need to thank all my co-authors, whose names I won't read for you, but um, obviously this work was all done as part of a collaboration, and so I'm very grateful for everything I've learned from these people. I'm going to take just a brief drink to warm up for what's coming next. <laughs> so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if Martin hadn't taken a chance on me and my apparently persistent emails. <laughs> um, when you when you first meet Martin, one of the first things that comes to mind is a little bit macho, you know. He's got this he-man thing going on. <laughs> And we see that sometimes, you know, it's like someone's you know, <laughs> <laughs> he just he just has to chest bump sometimes, you know. <laughs> I think we'll just watch that again. <laughs> <laughs> but poor Justin almost got bounced off the <laughs> Um But you know, he has he has other sides to him as well. He's artistic. <laughs> He's been known to dabble in light and color and performance art and what does it feel like if you put a glow stick in your nose? <laughs> no, he's, he's got a creative side. More than anything, I think we would all say that he's he's a little bit retro. Um, you know, he can he can rock that 80s look, those bright colors. He is not ashamed to let his, his true flag fly. <laughs> One of the most important things, though, in all seriousness, that I've learned from Martin is that sometimes you just have to go for it. The, you know, when we first designed this cruise in June that I've been talking about but not talking about, it was a pretty insane idea. And, you know, Martin taught me it's important sometimes just to go for things and try it and see what happens. And, you know, he, he lives by that. <laughs> he moves quickly and without questioning. And, you know, he just. You gotta be assertive sometimes. <laughs> but he's got an introspective side, you know, he's 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 not ashamed to take in a good sunrise with, a, with another another man and look out into that beautiful sunrise <laughs> moment. But more than anything, you know, Martin, and I think he would describe himself this way, he is without a doubt nerdy. <laughs> so it took a lot of work for me to drag him out of the lab, but um, eventually I did, and I think I think he's happy about it. <laughs> um, I also want to thank someone who has, has been a mentor to me in a lot of ways, um, and that is Dr. John Steelers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I'll just let this sit up here for a bit. <laughs> John and I have now tagged uh, over 70 Mahi together, so we've, we've got to know each other and uh, close quarters sometimes on the back of the boat. We've had, we've had a lot of fun. We've had a lot of adventures over the years. This is, coincidentally, the happiest I've ever seen either of these people. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of yelling and screaming that followed this event was something to behold. But I want to thank John. <laughs> 
I also want to thank everyone that participated in our June cruise. It was a little bit crazy, and I could not have done it without these people. We, it was truly a massive team effort. Um, we successfully tagged 50 Monty Monty and released them in the Gulf. It was, it was crazy. It was wild, and we had a lot of fun while we were doing it. So thank you guys for everything that you gave to that effort. I need to thank my lab, who have been incredible over the years and have supported me through everything we've all leaned on each other. Um, I mean, we've had a lot of fun while we're doing this. And um, of course, I have to thank my family. I'm so happy that they're here today to support me, and um, they've always done that, so it's no surprise, but it's, um, I'm grateful to them for everything they've done for me. And I would be happy to take any questions. there are other uh, gulf species of fish for which your results on mahi could be extrapolated to, a fish with a similar enough lifestyle or whatever that you could generalize the effects to other species? So we do use our work on mahi to extrapolate to a lot of the tuna species and other pelagics in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, I'm sure, I will say that, you know, Dams and fish and mahi have very different lake histories, very different um, everything about them, basically. But um, you know, we did we did see kind of different responses. So, for example, I didn't show this data today, but we tested damsel fish for oil exposure, and they they do not avoid oil even up to very high concentrations. So there are a lot of species specific differences. So I think well, we can extrapolate to some projects because that's probably the best you know best we can do. We're not going to really do these types of Experiments with bluefin tuna, for example, um, you know, there's likely to be species specific differences. 
Say the last part again. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, so the electro factor grid technique um, has primarily been done in freshwater fish. And um, I was curious about why that was until I started trying to do it in smart fish. And it turns out that measuring voltage changes in a highly conducive bath of water is difficult. Um, so the technique is somewhat limited in what you can pick up on, especially in marine species. Um, so I use a very highly, I use basically as much oil as I can get in solution. Um, so, and they do detect that. So I, I can't say for sure with this technique, um, what would be the lowest concentration they could detect. And it's because of that, um, seawater just being so conducted and basically stealing my signal from me. It's, it's really hard to tell. You kind of have to just increase the concentration of cues in order to get a response and measure. So that is one limitation of, of this. But I do think that um, a lot of studies have shown that behavioral assays are often even more sensitive. So I think we could use potentially behavioral data to assess where that threshold is. Um, so it could be that it's you know fairly, I think we tested it's like 27 micrograms per liter that they avoid. So that may be right around the amount that they can detect. Yeah. How many of you have had this show? Um, I think it's out of the 19, I think it's like 16 or so that I can for sure tell were predated at the end. So, um, and the other ones, I, I don't know for sure what happened. Um, but some of them, so obviously there are the fish that a day after you release them, you see that they're predated and you know that that fish may never have been feeling its best. Um, but you know, even our even our um, female that was tagged for 48 days was predated at the end of that track. So even even a fish that's really robust and doing fine for long periods of time with the tag, they do um, fall victim to predation sometimes. And I think in some ways that's just a factor of um, both how tasty they are and just how they're a little bit smaller than most fish out in the um, the pelagic zone. There, you know, we catch them frequently with bill slashes from marlin. So we know that they're a hot prey item for a lot of fish. Robin? Thank you. Can you relate the trunk size to the trunk distance the size of the That's a good idea. I haven't I haven't done that. Um, but you mean in terms of like body lengths per second or no, I haven't done travel like what is the largest fish for the No, actually. Um, so we've we found um, actually the most, so previous work tagging mahi has really tried to select because they're smaller than a lot of species you would traditionally tag with a, a tag, um, has selected just the biggest fish. And we, um, because of our testing in the hatchery, we were able to see that actually sort of intermediate size 70 centimeter fish seem to do fine with the tags. And that's um, what we found is that actually, yeah, the female that was tied for the longest was a 70 centimeter fish, and um, I think the second longest was, yeah, 72. Or, so it seems to me that there is an effect of not just size and being able to deal with the tide, but we know that these larger fish seem to get more stressed by the handling, and um, they're just not as resilient. So I think for whatever reason, those intermediate sized adult fish seem to do the best. Laila, in, in, very nice, very nice work. But in the in the um, experiments on the detecting the oil, you mentioned that they can detect the oil and they avoid it. But then you followed and said that they still spend thirty percent of the time in the side where there was pollution. But isn't that because the fish cannot go anywhere in your tank? So in in reality. It will not necessarily always be in the interface of the polluted water. True. Yeah, so some of that is we know that fish kind of like test their environment. Um, and so they may be kind of just coming up to that boundary of being like, oh, is this still gross over here? Yeah, it's still gross. Okay, back to the other side. And then, you know, a couple seconds later, I don't know, Maki may not have the best numbers. Um, <laughs> but they, so, so that is a part of that. And certainly, and that's that's an experiment where there's just so in the environment, you know, there's so many other factors like what habitat is the best, where is the you know the most preferable temperature, where is the 
the prey availability. So there's going to be a lot of confounding variables, I think. Um, but th that is a very good point. Thank you. There certainly could have been. We, we know that the spill overlapped temporally and spatially with the um, spawning habitat for all those pelagic fish, as you know. Um, so that that's certainly could have been. Yeah. But there's no evidence. We know that. Um, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that there, from Robin's nodding, that there's maybe some larval data from from surveys showing that there's larvae caught in the region. Yeah. And we know from tag data of um, bluefin tuna and um, blue marlin that they were in and around the area during the spill. Yeah. Thank you. So, you Lina, so what's, what's your hypothesis about what happens on the full moons? Why, why are they doing such different things? Yeah, so that's a tricky one. And I think part of it has to do um, the fact that they they don't have vision that's particularly well adapted for nighttime so they have kind of a generalist vision they can see pretty well daytime nighttime but like unlike the billfish that have like specialized brain and eye eaters that allow them to really see very well in the dark um they're they're not they don't have vision that's quite that good so i think probably a lot of their nighttime behavior might even be based off of predator avoidance um, so we know that a lot of the billfish don't really have a day-night pattern. They're kind of just moving up and down. Um, so some of that, when they can't see as well at the new moon, could be predator avoidance behavior potentially. And then um, I guess my hypothesis is then when there's a little bit more light availability, that might kind of lure them up back to their surface habitat to, to get some opportunistic prey um, where they can feed maybe a little bit better. But it's interesting that it is like the it's the exact opposite pattern you would expect to see um, for a species that could see pretty well at night. So it was, um, you would expect them to go a little bit deeper with more light to extend that field of vision. So I have to assume that at the new moon, they're just kind of doing something else. Sam? Uh, for those cases of predation, do you remember the timestamps for those? I do, yeah. So actually, that's a good point um, that all of our the cool thing about knowing exactly when your fish died um, is that you can actually look and see what the patterns of predation. So all of our predation events happen either right at dawn or right at dusk. And so that is also when these fish are sort of changing habitat. Um, you know, it's the lights coming back for the uh, morning, they're, they're sort of moving back up to the surface waters. So I think they may be particularly vulnerable during that time. When they don't have as good a vision as some other predators might, and they're sort of shifting habitats. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.